The America's Democrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to America's Democrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. This is America's Democrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. Political science professor Nathan Calmo reveals that people vote based not on policy questions, but on party, as if supporting their favorite sports team. Law professor James Foreman Jr. talks about the crisis in the criminal justice system and how every element of law enforcement passes the buck. And political author John Allen talks with Bill Press about Trump and North Korea. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Professor Nathan Calmo explains what we think we already knew. People nowadays vote based on party identification and group identity rather than on what they believe. And we say hello to Nathan Calmo, assistant professor of political communication and political science at Louisiana State University and co-author with Donald Kinder of the new book, Neither Liberal Nor Conservative, Ideological Innocence in the American Public. Nathan Calmo, thanks very much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. We appreciate your time. Is it true that politics anymore has little, if anything, to do with ideology, but is like a team sport where the only object is to win? I'd say for the the public, that's mostly true. There's really important distinctions that we make in the book between um, political leaders, um, po- people in the public who pay close attention to politics, and the vast majority of people who pay very little attention. Uh, attention to politics. So that distinction by political engagement really matters. The people at the leadership level are are often quite attuned to ideology. That's true to some extent for the most engaged segment of the public, but for most of the the, the voting public there really isn't much of an emphasis on ideology and instead people are really making their choices as you said based on this um, this team sport idea that they think of themselves as Democrats or they think of themselves as Republicans and whatever uh, it means for their, their side to win an election, uh, a vote uh, in Congress, that's what they're going to support. Is it fair to say that to run for office you need policies only because you're supposed to have some without regard to what you will do with them if elected? Well, that's an interesting idea. Um, I think that would be a, a mistake to take from our uh, conclusions. Um, it, I, I can see where, where that would seem to be the implication, and that's probably true for um, most voters. Uh, voters themselves are not going to be making decisions, for the most part, uh, on the basis of um, issue positions or um, broader abstract principles. And in fact, they, to the extent that they have those views, they're mostly looking to leaders to, to follow what their leaders are signaling to them. But it, on the other hand, it's still the case that candidates need to make appeals not just to the, the general electorate, but they also need to appeal to uh, primary voters who are going to be a little bit more ideological than the general public, at least. And they certainly need to appeal to um, other people in the party organization and groups that are allied with um, the party, so activists and, and fundraisers. So on the one hand, while it's true that, that with the, the general electorate, the, the particular issue positions are going to be less critical for a candidate, on the other hand, the kinds of um, um, efforts that candidates need to make to, to rally support uh, behind their candidacy from leaders and from organizations and activists, those are the people who are going to care much more about policies and about um, ideological principles. And it's for them that the, the candidates' positions and ideology is going to be most important. Without philosophical differences, are we supposed to choose leaders based on something else? I mean, aren't ideologies at least somewhat important in organizing thought? Certainly among uh, people who pay close attention to, to politics, you can draw out uh, implications of, of ideology um, into specific issues. In other words, in, some people see ideology as a negative. We actually see it as a, a positive. It's a way that citizens can uh, make 
better sense of politics. It's a tool that if you understand uh, a, an overarching ideology that you can make connections between this issue and that issue, even if they don't seem uh, to be related on their face. And so it's a, a way of organizing the world and, and making better sense of it. We, what we find is that in the absence of ideology, the way people are making decisions is on the basis of their social group identities. And in fact, uh, in many cases, they are, um, if there's a, a shift in, in partisanship, it's a result of the, the underlying social identities that people have, their, their race, their class, uh, other prominent aspects, maybe their, their region that they're from, and the attitudes that they have towards other groups in society. So in the absence of ideology for many people, certainly partisanship is, is a, a major force that's the primary force that's guiding people, but even partisanship is sometimes shifted by these underlying social identities and attitudes towards prominent social groups in society. So there's ideology and principles for some people, but in the absence of that, uh, people often uh, lean on their group attitudes and their, their underlying social identities that people like me tend to belong to this party, and so I'm also going to belong to this party, or people like me uh, in, in my social position are more likely to favor um, this issue if they're paying close enough attention to politics. So there's both ideology and group attitudes and group identities that play uh, a major role in, in people's attitudes. We're speaking with Nathan Calmo, Assistant Professor of Political Communication and Political Science at Louisiana State University, co-author with Donald Kinder of the new book, Neither Liberal Nor Conservative, Ideological Innocence in the American Public. Nathan, have you found that this this winning is the only thing mindset? Is it true in other democracies as well? It definitely is. It's um, sometimes in our focus on the United States, we we get lost and 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 uh, lose track of some of the broader patterns that are happening across uh, national boundaries. This is true everywhere that that parties are oriented towards winning control of of uh, government either. In our system with the majority or in, in some cases in other countries with the coalitions that form into a majority so that's true everywhere but uh, one thing that's unique about us um, or at least distinctive us uh, about us at this time is is the degree to which our two parties at the leadership level are are so polarized on um, issues when you have uh, uh, the, the two parties much more overlapping or, or have uh, overlapping um, factions within each of the two parties, you're more likely to see um, uh, lower levels of party unity in, in the government where, where uh, individual, let, let's say a, a more conservative Democrat or a more liberal Republican is more willing to work with the other side. Um, in addition to the, uh, the, the party as a team distinctions that operate not just for the public but also for leaders to some extent, um, when you have ideological underpinnings or issue underpinnings for the leadership um, that are dis quite distinct across the two parties, that reinforces the, the party as a team ideology and uh, uh, idea and makes it less likely for, um, less likely for you to see uh, working across. Uh, and, and so it sort of reifies the, the party as, as the ultimate uh, goal. Now, if Trump won the presidency based on being a quote-unquote winner and smearing his opponent, does that suggest that the Democrats need to nominate a similar personality who has progressive slogans? I don't think that's necessarily the case. I, I, I wouldn't say that the, the, the political science and political communication research say that that would be a, a bad idea, but, but um, there's actually not a lot of evidence that the, the messaging um, in a campaign or the personalities of the candidates make uh, a big difference. They can matter on the margin, certainly. Um, and as somebody who has political communication in my title, I'm a little bit reluctant to say that communication is often overstated, but um, nonetheless, that's what we find. Uh, on the margins, these things can make a difference. But actually, if you look at um, the way that the public uh, treated uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton in the last election, in terms of their evaluations and how they ultimately voted, um, even if they expressed um, some reluctance about these candidates or maybe an extra enthusiasm among some people, when it came down to whether you cast your vote for a Democrat or for a Republican, uh, despite all of the unique elements of the Donald Trump candidacy, people still treated um, the, the choice as if it were a generic Democrat and a generic Republican. In other words, the factors that we look at as much as a year in advance of the election almost perfectly predicted 
the the vote share outcome and the percentage that each candidate won um, even before we knew that those two were going to definitely be the, the candidates. And so um, although messaging can make a difference on the margins, really most voters, because they're not very engaged in politics, see a D next to the Democrat's name, and they see an R next to the Republican's name, and that's all that they really need to, to make their choice. And, and most people are not paying closer attention, or even if they are paying closer attention, that's still an, an overriding concern, whether they're, they're a Democrat or Republican, and these other aspects of personality and messaging seem to be much less impactful than that basic choice. Mm. So if only labels and tribal feelings make a difference, is there a point in running a campaign to persuade people to change their minds? That's a good question. Um, so it's true that most people are decided, most people um, identify as a Democrat or a Republican, and they, and, or they at least lean towards one side or the other pretty consistently. And that means that, at least for vote choice, their, their views are, are pretty locked in. Um, there's still a, a 10 or 15 percent of the public that might be open to persuasion um, one way or another, but kind of the, the challenge for uh, candidates and parties is that the people who are most likely to be persuaded are also the least likely to be paying attention. Um, and so um, we have this ideal of a, of a neutral citizen that pays close attention and then decides on the basis of arguments. And, and while there are some of those people, on average, the people that are undecided tend to be least likely to participate, least knowledgeable, least paying attention. And so that presents a, a real challenge. On the other hand, in terms of issue attitudes, um, although there's this model of the public having views and telling their, their leaders and then leaders acting on those views, in many ways what we find in the research is, is that the public is, is – uh, inverting that relationship. Uh, they don't pay very close attention to politics, so the, and politics is complicated, and so to the extent that they do have issue attitudes, it's because uh, Republicans are looking to Donald Trump or to Paul Ryan for cues about where they should stand on, on issues. They, they trust the judgment of these partisan leaders, and they say, you know what, I don't really know, but I heard that Somebody who I trust on, on my side supports this issue, so I'm going to support this issue. And it's the same on the Democratic side as well. And we see some evidence of this just in the last year or two of the, the change uh, among uh, Republicans swinging to be much more favorable towards Russia um, and, and other kinds of attitudes like that, where um, uh, you have traditional Republican positions uh, that Republicans are in the public are now abandoning uh, because of Trump taking different positions. And so um, there, it is possible to persuade, and, and it's especially likely to persuade on issues when um, you have a, a partisan leader who is talking to their partisan base. Then it's very easy to change people's minds. Um, if you're talking to people who are neutral, you might have a chance at persuading them if you're able to get them to pay enough attention. If you're talking to people on the other side, you're probably not going to have much of a chance. And not to mention the those that are easily swayed by the 30 second commercials that <laughs> that that air on television for the months and months ahead uh, of an election. I mean, that's got a huge effect, too, on, on those that just don't seem to care one way or the other. And all of a sudden they're making a decision based on that. Yeah, we do find that um, it, the, the research generally, not in this book particularly, but we find that um, when one candidate is uh, putting a lot more um, money into advertising and putting more ads on the air, that they are on the margins uh, a little bit more likely to get a higher share of the vote um, as a result. So if your message is louder than the other side, if you're getting your message out there uh, more frequently and to more people, uh, you can have a, a, a little bit of a persuasive effect, but usually that's on the the range of maybe one or two percent. It's it's relatively small. In the 2016 election, we saw that um, both in terms of the the ground game um, with the field offices, as well as for the uh, advertising uh, um, efforts by the Clinton and the Trump campaigns, that Clinton had a lot more of a ground game and a lot more of a, a messaging. Um, um, apparatus with her advertising, um, that probably was beneficial on the margins for uh, Clinton, but it certainly uh, put to the test um, the idea that, uh, that messaging is, is less important than other factors. And I think that's borne out in the evidence that we saw from 2016. 
Okay. Nathan Calmo, Assistant Professor of Political Communication and Political Science at Louisiana State University and co-author with Donald Kinder of the new book, Neither Liberal Nor Conservative, Ideological Innocence in the American Public. Nathan, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. We look forward to having you back again soon. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. You're quite welcome. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This social security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing, or one time, in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America, whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Racial justice expert James Foreman Jr. says law enforcement needs to be thought of more in the context of public health and not so much of law enforcement. We'll talk to him about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. These are hard times for America's gold miners who are scrambling to get ahead but seeing their pay dropping. Take Bob Mercer, who's been a top miner for years, but last year even Bob was down. He pulled in only $125 million in pay. Can you feel Bob's pain? Well, these are not your normal miners. They are hedge fund managers, digging for gold in the wonderland of Wall Street. Indeed, if you divided Mercer's pay in his bad year among a thousand miners doing honest work, each would consider it a fabulous year. Nonetheless, hedge funds are almost literally gold mines, although they require no heavy lifting by the soft-handed, Gucci-wearing managers who work them. These gold diggers are basically nothing but speculators, drawing billions of dollars from the uber-rich by promising that they will deliver fabulous profits for them. But the scam is that Mercer and his fellow diggers get paid whether they deliver or not. Their cushy setup, known as 2 and 20 works like this. One, right off the top, they take 2% of the money put up by each wealthy client, which hedge fund whizzes like Mercer keep even if the investments they make are losers. Two, if their speculative bets do pay off, they pocket 20% of all profits. And three, hedge fund lobbyists have rigged our nation's tax code so these Wall Street miners pay a fraction of the tax rate that real mine workers pay. This is Jim Hightower saying, last year, the 25 best-paid hedge fund operators totaled a staggering $11 billion in personal pay, even though nearly half of them performed poorly. Meanwhile, Donald Trump, who promised to close that special hedge fund tax break, is now promising to give an even bigger break to them. Guess who was one of Trump's most generous funders last year? Bob Mercer. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org.
This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. There are plenty of villains in a system in which 7 million people are under criminal justice supervision. But law professor James Foreman Jr. says they aren't just Nixon, Reagan, and Sessions, but all of us. And we say hello to James Foreman Jr., professor at Yale Law School, a former Supreme Court clerk and public defender in Washington, D.C. He's also the author of a new book, Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America. James Foreman Jr., thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. It's great to be here. And nice to have you with us as well. Your book takes a deep dive into the legal system and the pathology of crime. It's, but it's, it is much more complicated than lock them up and throw away the key, is it not? That's part of it, right? Lock them up, throw away the key is part of it. But I think one of the, one of the arguments of my book is that the way we built this system – this system that we now call mass incarceration, right, which is 2.2 million people in prison, 7 million people under criminal justice supervision, we're not even sure how many people, but multiple millions of people who have forever lost their right to vote because they have felony convictions and we did disenfranchise people with felony convictions in many states. That whole apparatus, it was built in part by some villains. Right. And today we talk about someone like Jeff Sessions, who on criminal justice matters, I think, can only fairly be called a villain. Um, And it was historically built by people like Barry Goldwater and Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan, um, who did some really terrible things on criminal justice matters. But it's also true that this was built by all of us, that all of us. And this is one of the arguments in my book. All of us were not to the same degree. But all of us were somewhat complicit because we've all bought into this mentality that the way we solve problems in our country, that when we see a social problem, we immediately think of it as a criminal justice problem rather than, for example, a public health problem. An example of this from my book um, is there's a city council member in D.C. named Dave Clark. He's a famous progressive in the city. He was opposed to the war on drugs starting in the 1970s. He knew Martin Luther King in the 1960s. He was a a lawyer for poor people. And then he becomes a member of the city council. And he does a lot of great work. But he starts getting letters from constituents saying, hey, there's addicts that are on the corner in front of my house. We got to do something about it. And I I found his archives, and I find a lot of letters with different complaints, including things like that. So what does he do when he gets these letters about addicts uh, in front of businesses or homes? He sends them off to to the head of a public agency. He then gets a response back from this head head of the agency saying, hey, I'm looking into this. And he forwards the letter on to the citizen. So that's like good – that's what you would want your local city council member to do, be responsive to your complaints. But who is the – City, the head that he sent it to. Did he send it to the head of the Department of Public Health, the Department of Drug Rehabilitation Services, the Department of Addiction Services? No. He sent it to the police chief. See, in this country, we've all adopted this mindset that, oh, addict on the corner causing a uh, you know, public disturbance, summon the police. And the argument that I want to make is that that's the kind of small step that almost goes unnoticed in history, that almost goes, goes unnoticed in policy. That small step to choose to summon the police as opposed to summon drug treatment counselors, those kind of steps repeated across 50 states and D.C. and the federal government, 3,000 counties over 50 years, when everybody buys into that kind of mentality, we build mass incarceration. You know, you may have just answered the next question I was going to ask you, and that the question is, America has 4% of the world's population and 22% of the world's prisoners. The question was going to be, how did we get there? Did you just explain that? Well, I think that's part of it, right? Part of it is what I just said, this idea that everybody's complicit, that it's a series of small steps across you know, different geographical communities and across time, right? It's all, but that's not, that's not the whole story, that, although that is an important part of it. Um, certainly racism and the way in which politicians uh, exploited 
the fears of the average voter, um, and they uh, used race as a way of doing that. Um, when you look at some of the the language that was used back in the 1980s when Congress passed the laws to uh, to punish crack, you know, 100 times more severely than powder cocaine. And you see a lot of very racist imagery on the floor in the congressional record from from representatives who say, you know, you know, there's this, you know, these Jamaican drug dealers with bulging muscles are invading our communities. And it's this really kind of loaded stuff. And so that's right. That's also a, a piece of the story. Um, and you know, furthermore, it's this way in which we have decided um, for too long in this country that there's a portion of our population, um, principally poor people, principally people of color, not exclusively, but mainly both of those groups that are somewhat disposable, that don't have a place in our society. You know, there's a harshness that pervades uh, American thinking, where we we sort of take the position that, you know, if you don't make it, if you aren't able to provide for yourself, then you are to blame for whatever comes next, for whatever harshness or, 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 or uncertainty or unfairness um, invades your life, you brought it on yourself. And we are particularly that way when we're talking about people of color. So it's all of those things together um, that have helped to produce uh, this reality that we're living with now, which really we should just call it for what it is, which is a, a human rights crisis. Mm -hmm. We're speaking with James Foreman, Jr., professor at Yale Law School, author of the new book, Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America. James, obviously, African-Americans want public safety as much as anyone else. But why is law and order the only thing they get from politicians, even black politicians? Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you asked that question because I think it's a very important part of the story. So the, the book that I wrote is a book that is trying to look at this question of mass incarceration and the development of punitive criminal justice policy through the lens of African-American communities, black elected officials, police chiefs, prosecutors, judges, you know, asking the question, what were these people thinking? What was my community thinking during this 50-year period? And so part of the answer of the book is that, and there's lots of people that I cite here, is that there was a lot of toughness. There was a lot of tough rhetoric. There was a lot of lock them up. You know, Marion Barry, the mayor of D.C., refers to people as gun thugs and drug thugs. And, and, and Maynard Jackson, the mayor of Atlanta, talks about people need to roast or they need to fry if they're a drug dealer and their drug sales leads to the death of somebody. So there is this very aggressive rhetoric. But it's also true that the people that I write about were very clear that they didn't want the criminal justice solution to be the only solution. So the folks, the black leaders that I'm writing about say over and over again, we want police and prosecutors, yes, but we also want more jobs. We want better housing. We want national gun control policy. We want mental health treatment. We want drug treatment programs. We want better schools. We want to fight racism and segregation. So they have what I call this all of the above strategy to fighting crime and violence, but they get one of the above. And the one of the above that they get is the law enforcement piece, right? And so the, the reason for this there's multiple reasons, but one of them is that the people that I'm writing about, these African-American elected officials, are overwhelmingly concentrated in cities. And cities are important. They're crucial, especially for deciding how we allocate police, et cetera. But there are things that cities can't control. And while city leaders have the capacity to fight crime, they don't by themselves have the capacity to fight the conditions that lead to crime. So over and over again, I see these elected officials saying things like, we want a Marshall Plan for urban America. They're going to Congress and asking Congress to treat black communities in this country the way we treated Europe after World War II and to reinvest and to revitalize and to rebuild. But because they don't have control of Congress, that is to say African-Americans as a minority group in this country can control some cities but not Congress, they have to find allies, right? They have to get other people to go along with their call for a Marshall Plan. 
and they don't get that support, right? Over and over and over, this is a story of black elected officials going to Congress, trying to get support for their initiatives, whether it's a Marshall Plan for Urban America or national gun control, which black leaders have been pushing for in this country since the mid-1970s, and, you know, and don't don't succeed. So in a way, black communities have ended up, in my, my argument, is with the worst of both worlds. We haven't addressed as a nation the underlying conditions that help contribute to crime. And what we've done locally is passed very, very strict laws that overwhelmingly target black people. You know, you've noted that black cops, prosecutors, and judges have become more punitive against black offenders. Is that because they all pass the buck among each other? I do think there's a passing the buck that happens in general in our criminal justice system. The system this isn't this isn't unique to African Americans, right? This is across the board, and and you see this. I mean, I'll have conversations with police officers where I'll say. You know, I want to talk about racial disparities in the criminal justice system. And the police officers will say, many of them will say, yes, you know, this is a big problem. We have to do something about it. And then they'll say, the problem is families. So, right, they're pointing to somebody before before them in the process in a way. And then they'll say, and the problem is the prosecutors and the judges pointing to people after them in the process. Then you go meet with a group of prosecutors and you talk about racial disparities and they'll say, yeah, it's a real problem. And they'll say, you know, the police, it's the police. It's how, what neighborhoods they choose. It's what cases they bring us. And it's the judges. So now they've pointed to somebody before and after them. And then you go talk to judges and they say, oh yeah, this is a real problem. Racial disparities in the criminal justice system. It's prosecutors. And so now they've pointed to somebody else. So there is this way in which, because our system is so diffuse, so in our criminal justice, we shouldn't even call it a system. We use that word as shorthand, but really there's nothing systemic about it, right? We have all these different actors who have control of their separate domains. So the police decide, you know, who to arrest. The prosecutors decide what charges to bring. The judges decide what sentences to impose. The legislatures decide what the sentence ranges should be that judges can act within. Probation and parole officers decide whether to revoke somebody or not. So, the, and and these groups almost never talk to each other, um, and are certainly not don't answer to the same individual. And then you have to multiply that times 50 states and 3,000 counties, because what I just described is how it works in one county or one city. So this is an, a non-system, right, if you will. And so when you have a non-system, it does allow people to pass the buck, right? It does allow people to say, well, yeah, that's really messed up. They should do something about it. And one of my arguments in the book and, and in you know talks and, and writing that I've been doing outside of the book is that if we're going to fix this problem, we can't make it a they problem. It has to be a we problem. We have to own it. And I would say that to progressives as well. I mean, it's easy to vilify people like Attorney General Sessions. Um, my goodness, he, he, he almost every week he announces another bad policy on criminal justice reform. But he's not the only or most important actor. And I think we all have to look at, you know, what role are we playing? So when I say don't pass the buck, I mean that for all of us, including those of us that are outside the criminal justice system. Because one of the biggest problems that we have right now, just to give an example that has nothing to do with the criminal justice system, is people who get released from prison or people that have felony convictions can't get hired for jobs. Now, almost everybody is an employer or an employee of some sort of you know, company. And so all of us can really ask the question, well, what, what's the employment policy at our firm for people that have criminal convictions? There was recently uh, the Ford Foundation went and did a presentation at a New York prison. And the Ford Foundation does great work on criminal justice reform around the world. And they presented their work, and one of the prisoners raised his hand, and he said, oh, this is really great. I'm so inspired by this. I just have one question. When I get out of this prison, could I get hired by the Ford Foundation? And there was silence in the room because for all their great work, they didn't know the answer to that question. And 
they, they thought the answer was probably no. And they were right. But here's the, to the credit of the Ford Foundation, and everybody can emulate them. They went back and they scrubbed their HR policies from top to bottom. They found they had lots of exclusions that made no sense. They had to keep a few, right? They had to keep a few restrictions on who they would hire, but they had a lot that were meaningless and they could get rid of. And then they went further than that, and they set up internship programs where they actually proactively go out and recruit people, and they advertise. Because one of the problems is people with criminal convictions believe that they would never be hired, so they don't even bother to fill out a job application in lots of circumstances, because who wants to get told, no, I'm not going to hire you, you have a felony conviction. So they set up internships where they actually advertise the fact that they are hiring people, including people, including considering people with criminal convictions. And their goal is to bring people in in three and six month paid internships. Hopefully they will succeed and then they can consider hiring them as full-time employees. Those are the kinds of non-passing the buck stances, right? Those are the kind of we're going to own this problem. We help to create it either actively or through our silent complicity, and now we are all going to try to fix it. Mm -hmm. How much of a factor is the privatization of prisons in the dramatic rise of incarceration in America? And what role do you think unions play in this? So, so those are private. So I want to talk about both of those things because they're they're both problems. So, so privatization is a small, a relatively small part of our prison system in terms of the percentage, you know, about 90% of prisons are government-run prisons as opposed to private prisons, but, but there are private contractors that have, you know, businesses that are, you know, that are selling products and in other ways um, running probation systems in some states. So there, there are private contractors and it is absolutely true, right? Everything we know about our political system is that people that have a vested economic interest are going to fight for policies that benefit their interests, right? That's not a left-wing critique. That's just – that's the definition of our political system, and that's the definition of how companies understand their bottom line, right? Every company, once it gets to be of a particular size – it starts to set up a government government relations office, right? Because they see their job as lobbying. Now, so if you give a company, whether it's a company that runs the prisons directly or whether it's a company that supplies the prisons or it's a company that runs a probation department, if you give a company an economic incentive in somebody el making somebody else's life more miserable, then you are going to get misery, right? By Just by definition. If the company makes more money by providing lower quality food and lower quality education and lower quality housing and lower quality health care to the people in the, its comp the company's care, and there's no real competition, which there isn't in a prison context, it's not like people can walk and go somewhere else, you are going to get more brutal, more harsh, less humane prisons. So in my mind, it's absolutely unconscionable and immoral that we would privatize in this way. How, having said all that, I also want to be very clear that the public prisons are no picnic either because the economic incentives exist there as well. And I'm spending the year, I normally teach at Yale, but I'm spending the year out in California. And California, despite having a Democratic supermajority the, in the state house, and despite having a Democratic governor, and despite being a state that right, doesn't, doesn't even get, barely gets campaigned in during a general election because it's so blue, California has incredibly, incredibly harsh and brutal prisons. And... I say to a lot of my friends out here in California, you know, you're not as liberal as you think if you're running a prison system like the one that I've, you know, spent time in. I was just visiting in San Quentin uh, last week. And so the reason that the force in part that keeps um, the tough crime laws that they have in California or fights to keep them is sheriffs unions, prosecutors' unions, and unions and organizations and associations of prison guards. 
So when we talk about vested economic interests in privatization, it's really important for us to remember that those same vested economic interests exist in the public sector as well. And so that's what makes that's what makes this battle so hard. At this moment, the reason why it's so hard in many states to reform the criminal justice system, even with crime declining and even with people's consciousness raised about the immorality of our system, is that you do have these very strong and powerful opposition forces, some of them private, right, to answer your question, but many of them public. Mm-hmm. You eloquently described the problems of crime and punishment in black America. Is there a reasonable or doable set of solutions? And where do you start? I do think that there's I do think that there's a reasonable and doable set of solutions. So the way that I think about the way that I tend to think about the issue is I kind of divide it up into kind of pieces. Right. So there's the there's the kind of root causes right? The conditions that help lead to crime. And there, I would say, from what I've seen, there's a lot of things that I would want to work on, schools, housing, mental health, drug treatment, all of that. But if you were to ask me, okay, fine, but you get to focus on one thing in this kind of root causes bucket, what's the one thing you're going to bring to a community that's suffering from high rates of crime to try to provide relief? For me, it's jobs. That's the number one thing. I was, I've was i seen it in my own work with kids in Washington, D.C. I started a program for kids from the juvenile justice system back when I was a public defender. And when I talked to my clients about what they needed to keep from returning to court, to keep from returning to the criminal justice system, almost to a person, they said, Mr. Foreman, we need a job. When you don't have – when you're poor – and you don't have any money in your pocket, if you're an adult and you can't provide for your family, or even if you're a young person and you don't just have any money to go out to the movies on the weekend, it is so demoralizing. And it sends a signal that society has no place for you, that society will never make a place for you. And it makes entering into the illegal economy with all of the crime risks that come with that, it makes it almost it's almost impossible to 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 not do it under those conditions so for me whenever i hear oh we're going to do saturation policing or hot spots policing right there's been you know 10 shootings in a weekend in chicago or eight shootings in a weekend in new orleans i always want to say i want to try saturation jobs I want to say I want to try hotspot jobs and don't scoff and say that we can't do it because there's no reason why we couldn't as a society decide that in a big city like Chicago or a big city like New Orleans that next weekend we are going to bring job 200 jobs to a particular neighborhood it absolutely could be done these could be public sector jobs I've seen it in DC where they've started hiring young people one of the programs that I'm, I'm involved with, young people get hired for half the day to go do public works projects. And they learn um, gardening skills and they learn uh, landscaping skills and then they take classes in the afternoon. And it's incredibly powerful and compelling and there's almost a 100% attendance rate because people are having a job, they're getting paid, and then they're seeing a reason to go along with their education. So that would be the thing that I would focus on, on kind of the root causes side of thing, and I think it's very doable. On the criminal justice side, I think the most exciting thing that we have going right now that I'm seeing is a program that started in Seattle but is spread to over 10 cities, and it's in Baltimore, New Orleans, and other places. It's called LEAD, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. And the theory there is, remember we were talking earlier about how when we see an addict on the corner then the motivation that a lot of elected officials have is to send the police officer, right? Mm -hmm. And then here's what happens. The police officer only has handcuffs. So they show up and they have a choice, do nothing or lock the person up. Well, what LEAD does is different. It gets the police force invested in helping to build drug treatment programs And it gives the line officer, that same officer that responds to that call on the corner, under the LEAD program, they have the authority not just to arrest, but they also have the authority to make a call 
to a drug treatment program with temporary housing and mental health counseling available. So that transforms the whole, right? That's now a whole toolkit that this police officer has available to him or her. And it's a way of moving away from this law enforcement mentality towards a public health mentality, like what we see in Europe and other countries that are able to address their drug problems, which with much less, uh, l- with much lower rates of prison. Okay. James Foreman Jr., professor at Yale Law School and author of the new book, Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America. James, thank you very much for your time with us today on americasdemocrats.org, and we do look forward to having you back again soon. Thank you. It was a great pleasure to have this conversation. Thank you for inviting me. You are quite welcome. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air. And help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press talks with John Allen, author of Shattered, Inside Hillary Clinton's Doomed Campaign. John Allen joins us uh, today, author, co-author of Shattered, uh, the great, um, uh, brutal book about the Hillary Clinton uh, campaign we've talked about before. And uh, we are looking at you on YouTube, youtube.com slash The Bill Press Show. Also looking at you on Free Speech TV, coast to coast, and so happy to join you on the Progressive Voice of Chicago, WCPT. John Allen, how's it going? It's going well. I mean, you know, aside from the threat of <laughs> nuclear annihilation. Uh, aside from living on the brink. Sort right? of on a day-to-day basis. Well, really, yeah. I mean, it's more like if you're in San Francisco or Guam. Yeah. Well, Sorry, Guam. Yeah, right. Guam is worried. They're, they're freaking out right now. You read this, the comments from the Guam officials, and they're like, they're like, it's not panic time. Anytime somebody says it's not panic time, it's panic, it's time. panic but, time. But like, why Guam? And I guess it's because these bombers that they were flying over in the close to North Korean airspace, right, were from based in at our base in Guam. Yeah, so, I mean, it's our land, right? So yeah. you hit Guam, you hit the United States. Uh, it's kind of like NATO. If you hit Guam, the rest of us have to like jump in. Right. So uh, we heard the uh, um, bombastic rhetoric yesterday from Donald Trump. We'll get into that in just a second. But we've also had some bombastic tweets this yeah. morning, Peter. Yeah, so let's read these and we'll get up to date here. We have tre- tweets from Donald Trump. Uh, he says, first of all, he spent the morning retweeting one, two, three, four, five, six different Fox News tweets either from The Five or from Fox and Friends. He's just constantly retweeting them. But his tweets this morning that he wrote, my first order is... What did they have to do? Were they all about North Korea, too? uh, Some were about North Korea. Some was about, let's see, uh, the media bias. Uh, Here's one where he talked about millions of gallons of Mexican waste threatened Border Patrol agents. That's a Fox and Friends retweet. Uh, he tweeted about the, uh, or retweeted a story about the France vehicle attack that left six soldiers injured, okay. uh, but then he jumped into his own tweets. All right. Okay. And he says, my first order as president was to renovate and modernize our nuclear arsenal. It is now far stronger and more powerful than ever before. Dot, dot, dot. That's simply not true. That's not true. I know. He I hasn't mean, done that in 200 days. No, we've no been way. doing threat reduction for, I mean, we've been <laughs> reducing our arms Plus, for many, many years, and you can't get all that done in six months. No, plus his modernizing started under Barack Obama. Joe Sirincioni has told us about it many times. many times. And you're right. You don't get it done in two, 200 days. Okay, right. so so okay, the first so. part, the first tweet there is complete BS. Uh, the second part of the tweet, or the second tweet, hopefully we will never have to use this power, but there will never be a time that we are not the most powerful nation in the world. Well, that second part is... Probably true. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm for the second part. I yeah. am too, for sure. Yeah, I am too. I and want I think us to stay the most powerful. I think it's anymore. true today, and I think, by the way, it'll never be forever, forever, forever. But far beyond, we don't have to worry about that. I right. think is right. Right. So we're, what we're talking about, of course, is what we heard yesterday uh, from the president 
up at uh, Bedminster, New Jersey, when he was asked about Kim Jong-un's latest verbal threats. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. Uh, pretty red-hot rhetoric, huh? What's it mean? Uh, well, it sounds like Truman, uh, between the two nuclear uh, mm-hmm. uh, detonations in Japan, I mean, he basically is... Almost an echo of Harry Truman. Almost an echo of Harry Truman. And I, I think that's important, but the difference here is Harry Truman had just shown what he could do. He'd already... I mean, the threat wasn't... But it wasn't just a threat. It was very clear what he was saying. We're going to do this again. Right. Um, with Trump, you've got this language that sounds like Kim Jong Un, and uh, you know the the idea that we're going to go in there and uh, and go nuclear on North Korea and annihilate North Korea uh, preemptively is one that is um, certainly not uniformly agreed upon in the American government. <laughs> Right, particularly among his generals that he's so fond of. Just just for the record here, because you and I have heard it probably in the last 24 hours, maybe not everybody has. This is all uncanny, almost to the day, August 6, 1945, Harry Truman. If they do not now accept our terms, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. Yeah, I it? mean, it's like they grabbed what Truman said. I know. I wonder whether they really did. I mean, I don't think Stephen Miller's coming up with a whole lot of new stuff on his own. Mm-hmm. The yeah. uh, president's national security advisor and speechwriter. Um, in, uh, I mean, the other thing to, to just sort of, I think, to look but, at here is Kim Jong Un at some point will have a nuclear warhead capable of reaching the United States, and maybe he does now. Maybe they have the ability now. Sounds like there's still some time off. Not that far. Donald but. Trump is egging on somebody who has the capacity or will have the capacity to do that. Harry Truman, when he was speaking to Japan in 1945, was talking to a country that did not have the power mm-hmm. to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, Good point. Th- right. It's not an escalation with somebody who has the ability to hit you. That said, you can imagine as Donald Trump is in his bed tweeting these things. Kim Jong-un is finding out by somebody uh, in a country who has internet calling him to tell him what Donald Trump is tweeting, and then he's, like, screaming into the air, right, because he doesn't really tweet. Um, clearly, he's feeling pretty diminished by uh, by all of this, too. And with a normal leader, that, would be a, uh, that wouldn't be such a problem. But who knows what this guy's going to do? Look what he does to his own people. Yeah, right. Uh, but wouldn't you say, like you, you, you started by saying, they're not the same person? There are there are a lot of similarities. Obviously, two monumental egos, right? Easily bruised egos, right? And b- both of them love the escalating rhetoric, right? I mean, that's that's their specialty, almost, right? So, um, but th- th- what's scary to me is that I think either one of them is capable of of making of doing something stupid like. Donald Trump saying we could have a limited military strike against North Korea that would teach them a lesson, like we did in Syria, for example. It wouldn't work in North Korea. Right. I mean, right? The, the problem is the United States believes that it can project its military anywhere in the world and actually have an outcome that is greater than um, greater than just destroying things. I mean, sometimes that may be true, but if you're trying to affect North Korea's behavior, I'm not sure you're sort of like traditional threat of military force works, or even the use of military force works. Um, and we are, I think it's easy to forget this, we are at war in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. We are <laughs> still at war in Iraq. Um, we still have Libya on our hands, even though we're not, you know, we don't have, uh, you know, a big military force there. The, the United States is projected all over the world right now. And one of the things Donald Trump promised when he became president is that he was going to bring that stuff back. And honestly... I thought that was a good promise. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I don't mean that we shouldn't have foreign relations or foreign policy or even the threat of military force, but in order to be able to threaten military force, you actually have to have the capacity to carry it out. It's not clear to me that we really have the capacity to carry out more military operations. Uh, I think we ought to be drawing back from Afghanistan, not in the way that Trump is considering now. A private military in Afghanistan is an awful idea. But uh, he promised to bring everybody back. 
And he's not done that. And instead, what we're seeing is a potentially potentially another conflict in North Korea, um, whether it be by traditional or nuclear means. This is not good news. And the president is not is not clearly succeeding in the first external test of his presidency. You know, it, it was interesting to me that yesterday, the same day that this rhetoric comes out of Donald Trump about North Korea, that CNN released a poll on whether or not people believe what they hear out of the Trump White House. 73% of Americans in that poll said, that's three out of four Americans said, th- th- they do not believe uh, anything they hear out of the Trump White House. Not credible. Uh, why that's not? that's why this is so dangerous with North Korea. Right. The, the, it really undermines, right, his capacity to, well, and the, and, and to lead con- and do anything. Conversely, if you're a president who believes that the American public no longer thinks that you follow through on what you say or that you're not credible. You want to prove that you do, huh? You want to prove that you do. And, I mean, that would I think that saying you're going to nuke another country and then nuking that other country would probably move those numbers of, I believe the president's going to do what he says he's going to do up. Yeah. To be fair, I think they're talking about a limited military strike, which would not be nuclear, which would be conventional missiles. A rain of fire like the world has never seen. That would be nuclear. Yes. I yeah. mean, the world has seen is... two nuclear uh, <laughs> yes. nuclear detonations yes. in Japan. Yes. Yes. You're right. I mean, that's what that language implies. I think what the military option that the White House apparently reportedly is considering would be a missile strike like we had against Syria, non-nuclear, but still would could unleash who knows what. I right? mean, you know, Steve Bannon has his way. H.R. Uh, McMaster, the national security advisor, is going to be riding a missile like that guy in, uh, <laughs> in Dr. Strangelove. He'll be the point of the spear into, into Pyongyang. Um, do you think that um, Congress would... Go along with this? First of all, they wouldn't have any role, I, I would imagine, uh, right? Unless you have a declaration of war. I mean, we've we've okay. sort of design, designed yeah. our system to uh, yeah. to militate against the sloth of the Constitution. I mean, I, it's a good thing because if you really needed to, to go to war in a short period of time, um, you could get Congress together and they could do it if it was a 100% thing. But, like, uh, having some capacity to – to have a strike in a short period of time, I think is probably advisable. Even though, uh, I would, deb- I would, debate. I, I, yeah, I I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. It's. I, I think there are good arguments on either side. I like our constitution. I like going to war with Congress. I think we've like completely abused um, yeah. the War Powers Act, which was, by the way, designed to be abused. Um, it has huge holes in it. War Powers Act was a way that, okay, the president can take some action, but Congress has to come within 60 days, right? And and otherwise the thing is off, right? Yeah. Yeah, but functionally it expanded the president's power to go to war instead of limiting yeah, it. Yeah, yes, it did, right. Uh, but, you know, if um, the, the other thing, and, it, it, and this was raised during the campaign, I'm sure you remember, is uh, we have a system today where one person, the president of the United States, makes a decision about nuclear war and pushes the button. And I, I mean, I don't care who the president is. Barack Obama, I don't think, should have had that power. Or Hillary Clinton. Well, we all know your problems and, with President Obama. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, all right, Don Ronald, I don't think any president should have you that power. You thought he should have done it certainly, faster, right? <laughs> no, certainly not Donald Trump. Uh, and one would think maybe this is a time when Congress is saying, maybe we ought to take a look at that nuclear decision-making process. What do they got? What is it like? Five minutes or eight minutes max between the president is told there's an incoming nuke or there's a threat which could or could not be real, yeah. and there have been many false alarms. Uh, and with Donald Trump, I made a reference to Doctor Strangelove earlier. I'll, yeah. I'll make a reference to failsafe now. Oh. You know, the the, uh, the uh, nuclear uh, concern novel from uh, what the late fifties, maybe. Uh, but I'm not sure what the other system is. I mean, do you really – if the nukes are in the air toward us, you kind of got to make a decision fast. True. If they are – if. Right. You could, you, you could have – but I think you could have a backup uh, anyhow. Um, we'll get Joe's here and see on the end to talk, tell us all about the backup. But, you know, when you have cases where uh, – one, one case out in a silo in North North Dakota, I think, they some guy just had a – a test video in and, yeah. and saw this and thought, oh, my God, here they come, right? Because, of course, 
you know, there's constantly the threat of an imminent right. nuclear war that you weren't looking at. I, I do think that it might make sense to have some sort of different procedure for uh, preemptive strike. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But a reactive yeah. strike, you probably don't have a lot of time to make a decision. Um, earlier in the week, or a couple of days ago, uh, Donald Trump on his tweet storm was talking about how his base is bigger and stronger than ever today. Is it? No. Uh, polling suggests that his, even his most ardent supporters are backing off and that his base is actually shrinking. I'm willing to accept that polling on this may be a little bit off. It is not off to the extent uh, that it would have to be. To, I mean, first of all, the poll is measuring against previous uh, previous installments of the same poll. Um, so you can see trends in that, whether mm-hmm. or not it's off by a few points. Also, when you get to see the president at 36% approval, right, add five points. At eight points, he's still in trouble. He's still got a base that's that's um, shrinking, and he's got a base that's less happy with him. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 and by the way, what do but, they have to be happy about? The, the only thing you could be happy about if you were a Donald Trump supporter is him sticking his middle finger up at the establishment. Yes, yes. I, I was just going to say that. But, but, but to people that I talk to, or the people there, is they're happy that he is driving people crazy in Washington. Right, yeah. and, and and attacking the media, and they love that. Well, I mean, I'd love to see a Venn diagram of New York Times readers and Donald Trump supporters because I think it's almost zero, mm-hmm. right? The the, the intersection zero. of of those two <laughs> right. things is, or, is zero, and so you know, I'm not sure. I mean, the New York Times for him is is a specter. It's a it's some something he's raising to attack that his supporters are not even familiar with. I mean, it's just the idea of the New York Times. I think the more that they, his supporters, see Congress is unhappy, people complaining, the establishment complaining, the more they, that they say, this is a, that's what we want, right? That's, what we'll, that's why we voted for them. I think they're happy with those things if those things do not align with a failure to achieve anything. I mean... If the whole point was to send Donald Trump here to scream and yell at people and not actually change anything, uh, then he's doing great. If the point was to send him here to change things, uh, then he's failing at that. And I think that, look, in in fairness to the president, he walked into a city after having said for the entirety of the campaign that he was going to come here with a hatchet – uh, and he wanted to change things. Or he, he was going to drain the swamp. Drain the swamp, whatever. whatever. But I mean, yeah. the, the point was he was going to destroy institutions here and change and change our policies in a lot of ways. And he ran into a bipartisan uh, establishment that wanted to fight him on that. And they are digging in and they are fighting him on it. And uh, people are leaking against him. And if I were him, I would look at it and say, yeah, no, no wonder I came in here and said I was going to change things, and these people are resistant to change. It's going to be tough. So when you look at what happened with health care and when you look at what happened with the Russian sanctions, has he lost, in effect, lost control of the Republicans in Congress? Yes. I think, I think the fear of standing up to Donald Trump has uh, evaporated. Um, I think that people are still – I think Republicans on the Hill are still cognizant of the fact that – the majority of Republicans in the country still support him. So, you know, people running out there and screaming and yelling about how bad Donald Trump is are limited. I mean, Jeff Flake, Ben yeah. Sass, whatever. Um, but I do think that he's lost the benefit of the doubt with them. And I, I don't think he had a big margin of benefit of the doubt to begin with. Uh, the more that his base erodes, the easier it is for Republicans to distance themselves. And then at some point becomes uh, necessary for them to distance themselves. Of course, it depends on if they come from states that are uh, you know, a little more um, balanced or districts that are a little more balanced. But it, at the end of the day, um, Donald Trump is not giving Republicans on the Hill any reason to be supportive of him. Even Mitch McConnell yesterday came out and, yeah, and yeah. ripped him. And I basically said, you blame Donald Trump for the fact that we didn't get health care done. He right? said Donald Trump came in and imposed these artificial deadlines that were, yeah. uh, you know, not thoughtful about how Congress operates. And uh, to me, you know, that is also a rip at Mike Pence, the vice president, who Good is point. Good basically point. Donald Trump. was Trump's, up there all the time, yeah. He was basically Donald Trump's yeah. big emissary on the Hill. Right. And he came from the House. And when he was in Congress, he, like a lot of other people in the Trump administration who were in Congress, 
uh, spent most of his time trying to figure out how to defeat the priorities of a Republican government. Mm -hmm. They have zero experience in actually legislating. And Pence, I think, is actually is a pretty gifted politician. I, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm impressed with Pence uh, and have mm -hmm. been for a long time on the, on the mm -hmm. level of being able to communicate well and get some things done. But uh, he's... He obviously has been part of this mis misunderestimating of how Congress can operate. <laughs> That's all for AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Nathan Calmo, James Foreman Jr., and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you like what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.